This week's On The Ledge is supported by Hoppy, the home management website where you can save money on your household bills and find tradespeople for all those jobs around the home. Why not see how much time and money you can save today at hoppy.co.uk. That's hoppy.co.uk. Podcast, Perone. It can only be on the ledge. In this week's show, I'm joined by Claire Ratinon, a food grower extraordinaire, to talk about her new book, How to Grow Your Dinner Without Leaving the House. And we also talk about the knotty issue of racism in horticulture. And I answer a question about a crassula ovata whose leaves have suddenly got very small. How mysterious. Just a warning, this show is usually a swear-free show, but for one week only. And in order to discuss a particular post of Claire's, I've rated this show as explicit because the F word does pop up a few times. And so if that mortally offends you, you may wish to skip this episode. But otherwise, keep listening because Claire has stuff to say that you need to hear. Those of you who follow me on social media, specifically Instagram, may be aware that I was having a little bit of a moment this week about the price of Sansevieria's, certain Sansevieria's, I should say, and promised that I was going to say something about the price of rare plants in the podcast. I'm not going to do that this week because I want to give full breathing room for my chat with Claire Rattanon. But next week, I will be devoting a whole episode to talking about rare plants. What is a rare plant and when does our pursuit of rarity begin to tip over into something that is a little bit ugly and not so good for the house plant industry. So I'll be getting into all of that next week. If you've got any thoughts on the matter in the meantime, do drop me a line. And thanks to those of you who've been in touch about last week's leaf botany episode about silicon with Dr Julia Cook. I had a really interesting email from a listener called Dave he wrote, we, in the US, we could buy silicon pre-blended into compost. It comes from Wollastonite, a natural mineral that releases silicon at the right level for absorption. I work in research and development at the mineral supplier. We have companies in the UK bringing this to the market, but I can't say who. Ooh, interesting. And Dave also warned that the liquid silicon products that are used for often in hydroponic systems are, he said that they do need to be used with care because they're very concentrated and have a very high pH. So you have to use them only at the recommended dose and not any higher. Otherwise, you might kill your plant. And he says this explains why mineral based supplements are being researched and bought to the market because they're a slower release form of silicon. So you're not going to end up overdosing your plant. He goes on to say that there are two natural minerals that do this, Wollastonite and diatomaceous earth, which some of you might be familiar with because it's sometimes mixed into potting mixes as a way of dealing with pest problems. So there we go. Silicon is coming to a houseplant supply shop near you by the look of it. I'm really fascinated by that news and I want to hear more. So if anyone else has got an inside track on silicon and specifically who is doing this kind of work in the UK I'd be interested to hear from you and now on with the main attraction this week my interview with Claire Rattanon who is Claire she's an organic food grower and she's worked in some amazing places from growing crops for Ottolenghi's restaurant Rovi to delivering workshops throughout London to audiences including schools community centres and corporate clients And you might also have heard her on BBC Radio 4's Gardener's Question Time, that institution here in the UK. She didn't start out growing food, as we'll discover in the interview, 
but she really has caught the bug. And the brilliant thing about this book is it is aimed at people who don't have a massive country estate to grow their fruit and veg. Maybe you've just got a windowsill or a balcony or a patio or a ledge to grow on. And this book will really inspire you to try new crops and pick up some simple things to make things thrive. So if you've just been growing houseplants up to now, but you fancy trying your hand at something from an oyster mushroom to a delightful purple chilli, then this is the book for you. In the first half of our chat, we talk about the book. And in the second half, we move on to talking about horticulture and racism, something that Claire has been actively discussing on social media, which is a brave thing to do because not everyone wants to hear that message. And we'll hear how she got that message out and the reaction in part two of the interview. Do go and check out the show notes as you listen. There are lots of useful links there to the things we're talking about. So it's always really worth having a click through to janeperone.com and finding those links. It really does help you get a rounder picture of what we're talking about on the show. Claire Rattinon, you are here to talk to me about your new book, which I've got in my hands, and it's a very tactile and beautiful book. And I'm very glad that you've written this because there's so much really bad advice out there about growing vegetables. Is there not? (laughs) Can we agree on that? There absolutely is. Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) I'm glad you're happy this book exists. It was a, it was a labor of love, but um, yeah, I really, I'm excited about it. I'm so chuffed that, um, that it's, well, it's, it's obviously struck a nerve and there's, there's a need out there, isn't there? There's, a, there's a people who are aching to be growing in containers for various reasons. And um, yeah, it'd be, uh, my, my hope is that this is the, the thing that will, will get them going and encourage them and give them some, some good advice. This must have increased your audience because there has been this huge, huge move towards uh, growing food during lockdown. What, why do you think that the, the pandemic sort of sparked off that reaction? Was it just about food shortages or was it about something more kind of fundamental or instinct? I think it's a multitude of things. I mean, initially, I think it, I, do, I do think it was tied up with that kind of like rush to the supermarket and and suddenly seeing things that we had taken for granted, not, you know, those shelves being empty. Um, and so I think there was an instinctive move towards this idea of like, oh my, I don't know where my food comes from. And I don't have control over that if it's not on the supermarket shelves. And then maybe that's something I need to understand and learn. And then I think there's also that, that element of, well, we're going to be in lockdown. What are we going to do? And if, you've, if you're lucky enough to have the space to do it, then growing food is a great thing to, to learn when you have the time. Because, you know, a lot of people probably think they don't have the time to grow food. And that's why they haven't, you know, made the time to 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 go through that learning process and give it a try. So I think there's, I think there's a multitude of things happening. But I also think that, you know, in moments of crisis, you look to what's important and you look to what's essential and connecting and like universal and growing food is one of those things. It's like deeply, um, it's, it's a profound act as well as a, you know, an act of, of necessity and, and utility, isn't it? It's like, there's something very, grounding and humanizing it's like the thing that that unites us all is is the act of growing food and so I do think there was something more profound about moving towards doing something um meaningful in that very un- unnerving time that arguably we're not out of yet you know maybe we've just become a bit acclimatized to being unnerved but I do think the first initial initial thing because I got quite a few messages from friends who have never grown food before he said to me you know oh I wish I had your skills there was no kale in the supermarket I was like, if I sow a seed today, I won't have kale by next week. Like that's that's not how it works, you know. And so I do think there is some element of it being like, oh, there's not the ingredients that I want. I wish I had the control over the system to to control over those systems to to make that possible for myself. So from from the more, more simple to the more profound, I think it was a mul- all, all those things play, playing into the this kind of collective impulse towards sowing seed. Because this is where it's difficult with growing food in that in many respects, it's easy to say, 
it is it's so easy yet it's so difficult at the same time I, i'm trying to find a way of expressing this but you know i saw a tweet from somebody saying so i've just realized that if i want tomatoes i have to sow them every year <laughs> now on one level like that is like it makes us laugh because yeah. you know if you but there's another level it is that kind of there is there's such a disconnect mm. for some people that, that even that's something that just to anyone who's been growing for a, m- many years or even a few years is an obvious yeah. thing to say. Actually, some people are starting from that very low level of not mm. understanding any sense of a cycle to do with certain plants being annual, mm. certain plants being perennial. So, the, you know, that the level, the mountain you've got to climb is perhaps greater for those people than even we would expect it to be. But you do say in the introduction to your book, you say, I honestly believe that if you want to grow your own, it is possible even in the city, even without a garden. Now you've, you've been there and done that. You um, have, have lived in the city. Can you tell me a bit about how growing came into your life? Was it something that was there from a young age or was it something you got into as you as you grew um I, i'm a latecomer to 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 feed growing to to nature connection all of that stuff i i didn't grow up with that sense of you know deep connection with the with the earth and sowing seeds and growing food when i was when i was young it was very very much a um of, of no interest to me actually and so the person that you just described who wrote that tweet that was me not that long ago you know it was I I'm an, I I've been growing food for I think this is probably my as, as a job as my sixth season but um I was volunteering for years a couple of years before that and I actually discovered food growing when I was living in New York and and chanced upon a, a rooftop farm there that completely changed my life. But but yeah, I I, I really empathise with, with being that person who really didn't understand how what those processes were, what it looked like to, to to grow food for us to eat. I had no sense of that, so I could very easily have been the person who was, who who found it in, like startling that you had to grow tomatoes from scratch every year, at least in this country and. and you know, in the northern hemisphere um but yeah i i started growing started volunteering at brooklyn grange which is this amazing rooftop farm in new york and um it was completely by chance i was just happened to be walking in this part of my neighborhood that i don't normally go to looking for something that didn't exist and there was a sign on a door and i followed it with my friend up to the rooftop and and it's this incredible just over an acre of productive space full of vegetables and I was just really bowled over and um and then went back over and over again to volunteer every Saturday every day that I was allowed to really and and that was where it started for me but that was in my late 20s I was yeah I think I was 27 28 when I, I found Brooklyn Grange and and um and yeah I just found a sense of meaning and purpose that I hadn't found elsewhere and I used to work in tv and film and documentary and and uh, as much as I, I really loved those years I I think that there was something that like really clicked for me in engaging myself in the process of growing growing plants specifically edible plants that I just had had never really accessed within myself before a sense of like purpose and satisfaction and just like it was so joyful as well I just really really love food and I really love to eat and so there was you know that 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 being participating in the full loop of like sowing a seed all the way to harvest and then taking that home and turning that into dinner was just like mind-blowingly brilliant to me so that is that's how I got started and I've yeah kind of ridden that passion into thankfully a sort of slightly haphazard career (laughs) well you know you've 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 worked in lots of different settings and so you've got rich a rich uh tapestry of things to draw on for this book I must just say though going back to tomatoes whenever I talk to anyone who sort of you know has has a a balcony or or a little patio and has never grown anything before they always start with tomatoes what is it with that why do people always think that tomatoes are the i mean uh, you and i uh, you know having as i say you know f- few years of growing tomatoes mm-hmm. under our belts you kind of think every year for me anyway every year and i think i know what i'm doing with tomatoes but every year something goes wrong yeah. in a different way they're not the easiest things I, I just i guess it's something they're very 
visual people understand mm. how they grow what do you think it is with tomatoes that everyone wants you're to grow absolutely them? right and it's probably the first thing other than salad which was what I was trained to grow in initially it's probably the first thing that I sowed when I was trying to grow something at home and um which was a laughably um appalling attempt of growing tomatoes completely indoors um I don't know why. I just think it's because they are the grow your own classic, right? They, they they are very satisfying to grow when they work and they and they are abundant and they work well. And I also, I think I think that a lot of the skills that you will then use in other plants, you, you can cultivate them through that process of growing tomatoes. As with most plants, it's wonderfully straightforward, but not always easy. You know, there's there's it, there's there's logic to it once you engage in the process, but it doesn't make it an easy process necessarily. But yeah, I don't and honestly know. I think it's one of those things that like everybody assumes that's what you're supposed to start with. And so we all just keep feeding that story over and over again by by doing it. Because <laughs> I'm sure I do it to other people too. I'm like, why don't you start with tomatoes? Everybody's got them. <laughs> So don't start with anything too tricksy. It's like, you know, I, I, that's one of the things that you see growing up. So maybe it's just pure ubiquity. But I think that's one point where people do go awry right mm. at the start in that, and, and your advice on this in the book is excellent, in that most people sort of do look at what other people are growing and what they think mm-hmm. they should be growing rather than thinking about what actually do I like yes. to eat? <laughs> you know, I see so many allotments where there's like more onions planted than anybody could eat in a year or uh, just like yeah. rows of cauliflower and you think do you really eat that much cauliflower <laughs> I don't know what you mean and I think that's the same with growing in containers that you know we're sort of subject to these mm. ideas about what we should be growing that aren't necessarily don't necessarily align with what we actually use in Absolutely. the kitchen um, and I, I liked the way that you um, you know you pointed out that you know a single courgette plant can produce up to 30 fruits like how much yeah. do you like courgette? <laughs> what can you do with these in the kitchen? Absolutely. Because um, that's, that's a classic classic as well, isn't it? The courgette. is like, I love courgettes. I, I, but even this year is a perfect example. It's the first year that I've got an actual space that's, that's mine that I can grow in. I'm, I moved to the countryside at the end of last year. And I've got six courgette plants. It's too many. I, 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 I know, it's too oh. many. <laughs> And I don't know what I was thinking, but it was. But I also have. I always have early spring jitters. I sow too many, and always assume that I'm going to have a loss, and then occasionally I'll be lucky, like this year, and I'll I'll do well, and then I'll have too many plants, and should probably give them away, but mm. didn't have an opportunity, and just I can't can't bear to throw a healthy seedling into the compost, so I just found a bag to put it in. Um, but yeah, I've got too many courgettes. But but luckily for me, I do like courgettes. But we are growing more than I can we can we can eat, and so they're going to all the neighbours. It's that time of year where it's like. It's almost a, an, an assault that we keep just like flinging them at whoever's closest by. But yeah, if you don't like courgettes, just because it's a great plant and it works, if you've got the right conditions for it and it works well, don't grow it if you're not willing to eat that many courgettes or you haven't got somebody who's willing to at least take the excess because that's a waste of some really precious space. Because that's the decision that you need Indeed, to make is often yeah. if you're growing in, in small spaces or your, your sunny space is limited, um, you have to make a decision about how you're going to use it because you, you and I, the, the reason why I've got six plants is that I've finally got the room to grow them for myself and therefore I have completely overdone it. But if I was growing in, in on a balcony, there's no way I would grow six courgette plants. It would be so depressing because I wouldn't be able to have space to grow all the other things that I would want to get to, to experience in the season. So yeah, I think you have to really take the time to plan what you want your growing season to look like because you don't want to end up in August having far too many courgettes and no desire to eat them. Do they grow well in containers? Presumably, they I've had do. really good luck with that, and that's why I included it in the book. and And the thing to remember is, when it comes to your hungry feeding plants, you know, when they're really, really hungry for nutrients, that the compost will run out reasonably quickly so the thing to do is you just have to keep on top of feeding them and you have to keep on top of watering them and as long as you do that they're doing great I've, I've got two two in bags because <laughs> because I run out of space in the ground we've got two in containers this year and they're doing really really well and 
yeah, um, I, I would definitely recommend it. It's, um, it but it do, they do need a big container. So you couldn't do that in a, you, they're not a windowsill plant, put it that way. They're, um, they do they do require, I think, I'm, I'm trying to think of how much I recommend in the book. I'm sure I said you know, sort of 50 litres. You could probably do it in about 40, 40 litres, but you want, you need a big, big container for a courgette because it is a big old plant, but it will, if you like it and you take care of it, it will, it will reward you. So it's definitely be worthwhile. I mean, I'm sure there are some people listening to this who are despairing because they think I'm never going to have a tomato plant or a courgette plant because I've only got a really chilly north facing balcony or I've only got a windowsill out, uh, windowsill inside or a window ledge outside. Is there hope for those kind of people? What, what can what can they expect in uh, the most unpromising setting to be able to grow in containers it's, it's such a hard one isn't it because i do that question comes up all the time i've got a north facing space i mean it's, it's really difficult plants a lot of plants require sunshine you know they there's edible ones especially if they if you really want to, to to cultivate a harvest but there's two things that i included in the book with people who who have a kind of challenging space in mind and not as much access to sunshine and the first one is microgreens and this is kind of a bit of a classic of if you ha- if you don't have the ideal situation what can you grow so the thing about microgreens is you can harvest them at any point in their life cycle so if they're starting to look stalky and leggy and, and weedy even only after you know two weeks or even less you can just harvest them eat them in, in your dinner and then start over so that so microgreens are really really forgiving and that's pretty much any leafy vegetable can be grown as a microgreen and um and i'm a big fan of them because especially in the bleak midwinter when you're just really craving like a little bit of like, like a, f- a freshness that is is lacking microgreens can go from seed to harvest within like kind of seven to ten days depending on what variety what kind of plant you're growing so um so microgreens are a good option i mean i I know it's not as satisfying as as nurturing a plant from a tiny tiny seed to a great monstrous sprawling you know courgette or a tomato or a or aubergine or a pepper but I mean, they are satisfying and it is it does at least allow you to bring some freshness into the kitchen so i do really love that and and i've also included a section of mushrooms which you do not need sunlight to grow because they're well technically not a plant they're a fungi but they do not they do not photosynthesize so you can grow them in a cupboard if that is all the growing space that you've got so <laughs> there is something for you <laughs> I did a, a mushroom kit a while back and it was so cool. I have to say, I loved it. It was really, really fun. And the speed at which they grow is quite spooky. It really spooky. is. So, it really goes from like zero to 100 miles an hour in no time at all. Yeah. And they, yeah. I just, I think the thing that I love the most about them, yeah, the speed is fantastic. Watching them grow is just amazing. But they're just beautiful. They're just so divine. I just mm. loved how structural and how stunning they were. It was so fun to take their photographs in to the book it's so wonderful yes, I remember yeah. I, I think I sent I sent all the images to my editor having edited them myself and she was just like why are there so many pictures of this oyster mushroom and I was like because it's just so beautiful I couldn't stop myself mm. and so I, I think there's there's so much satisfaction because it's such an implausible it's seemingly implausible process to to watch unfold isn't it I mean we're sort of somewhat accustomed to watching a, a seed germinate and watching a plant grow which I still find totally miraculous every time I do it but yeah with mushrooms that's just wild and amazing and and also you know there's lots of amazing kits that use use recycled you know that use um waste products in order to grow the the mycelium on you know using spent coffee grounds and so it can be it can be a really great way to kind of recycle something that might otherwise end up in landfill which i really love i'm fully convinced that mushrooms are going to save the world that's another podcast totally. topic, but uh, we should all be growing mushrooms it's it's definitely that's definitely something that um, i'm realizing more and more and you know also on a much smaller level obviously you've got the amazing work of mycorrhizal fungi in, with our plants so there's a lot going on there i think as i say that's a whole nother podcast strand right there. oh yeah <laughs> now i was going to ask you what's your most what's the most underrated thing to grow indoors but maybe it's mushrooms but is there anything else or to grow on a windowsill or a window ledge or you know that's small and that people wouldn't think is i guess it's maybe it's microgreens is that the other is that the answer most underrated that's a really interesting one what's most underrated i think do you know what i would say i would say edible flowers 
Edible oh, flowers yeah. are so wonderful because they give you, they're, they're just, you know, it, it's a, a twofer, isn't it? You get the beautiful, they look beautiful and they're so, they're, they're great for pollinators and they're just joyful to behold. And then, and then you can eat them, which is just, it's a feast for the belly and the eyes. It's so cheesy to say it, isn't it? But I just don't think they're really satisfying and just a wonderful thing. I think we never think, we don't really think of flowers, although obviously that broccoli at the flower and et cetera, et cetera. But we don't really think of flowers as something that we can add to our dinners, but I really love edible flowers and some of them have really great, that taste really incredible. So, yeah. yeah, I think if mushrooms aren't going to save the world, nasturtiums might definitely save the world because, I mean, uh, my garden is like the world's driest garden. I'm gradually realising over the years that I've got to like make everything super drought resistant and nasturtiums are brilliant because even if they, in the, earlier in the season when it was a bit drier and I wasn't watering enough, they kind of were limping along. But we've had some rain and they've just exploded and it's... Everything's edible. What's not to like about that? Plant? Totally. I mean, this, and it's so forgiving, isn't it? It's like if you really are, if you consider yourself to be someone who can quote unquote kill anything, although I, I dispute that because plants die, sometimes it just happens. So I, I, I don't let people blame themselves for that. But if you're one of those people who think that they can't, they can't grow anything, the sturtiums are for you. They can sometimes be a little tricksy to germinate. They've got quite a tough outer seed coat. But once they've germinated, they're just like, I don't need you anymore. <laughs> and just like, I'm good just leave me alone actually if you fuss over me then I'll punish you by maybe possibly doing something funny but if you they they love they sort of thrive on neglect don't they so they are they are the, the plant for everyone are they is there any way to sort of trick them into germinating and get over that hard seed coat do you soak them or I do I do that and like I that? also nick them with a with a knife which is obviously something you have to be very careful with but it, by, by that you just sort of chip the seed coat so that you can so the, the water that then that is um that you can imbibe the water a little bit more readily so I sometimes chip the seed coat if I'm not having any luck with soaking or do both actually and it's such a cheap thing, isn't it? You can buy nasturtium seeds so cheaply. My current favourite is um, the one with the variegated leaf. I think it is it Alaska. I've got that. Going. I have two, only because a friend gifted it to me. It was so kind. I they, I, I actually didn't have any luck with my nasturtiums this year. Well, I have one round of them. I was like, why aren't they germinating? And my good friend Hannah um, was like, oh, actually, I've got lots. And it was literally, they were, it was sown by a seven-year-old growing in a mushroom tray. And I was like, well, look at me. <laughs> I've been outshone by a child. <laughs> but, um, but I didn't realise they'd only just germinated. And then actually now they've grown and I've put them in the ground. They do really, really beautifully. And they are the beautiful variegated ones. They're stunning. And delicious. Yeah, they are great. And they're and as I say, once they're going in a pot, they will just romp away. And you can eat the whole thing. You can it's even eat really the unripe leaves. seeds. Yes. yes and yes, the yes. leaves. Yes, they're really, really good plants. They're, they're, I agree with you. That's a really top tip. And I like watching my children's faces as I say, oh, try this leaf. And then they eat it and go, mom, it's so spicy. <laughs> it's so their true. tolerance for spice is not, is not established yet. So um, they've got a little bit of a way to go. I want to go back to tomatoes for a second because... Um, this year, I, I've been doing that lockdown thing of like finding old packets that have been sitting Excellent. around for a really long time and uh, germinating, germinating them and growing them. And I've got a, an old trial, I think it was from Thompson and Morgan trial tomato, which is a bush tomato. And it's actually really good, but I've no idea what the variety is. Are there for any really good varieties that work well in a container if you've got just a smaller map space? Because some tomatoes can get seriously massive, can't they? They can get as tall as you, which is obviously not what you necessarily want. In fact, I've got some in containers which shouldn't be in containers and they're, they've kind of like toppled over and they're leaning into the jasmine on the wall because they're just like we can't go we're top heavy so uh, are there any really good varieties that you'd recommend for container growers? absolutely i would recommend looking for varieties that are that are was specifically bred to be dwarf varieties and um so that's not just bush so it's not that you so obviously there's there's the indeterminate ones which i'm thinking is what you you've got which are the ones that are towering and those ones are the ones that you train or cordon tomatoes and then there's the um determinate ones which are the bush which you generally don't train but they can they can get quite massive too so it sort of depends on the size of the container but if you're really working with a really small space there are there are some really great um varieties like the, the kind of tumbling varieties that do really really well in hanging baskets and there was one that i grew for the book that i just thought was absolutely amazing and it was it came from real seeds and it was it was literally just called the house drawer 
dwarf cherry tomato. And it was so compact that it was it was just perfect. And it was really, it was way more prolific than I, could, than I expected it to be. But it was, it was really quite tiny. It looked like a house plant. It was really, really tidy. And so if you managed to get that sort of off to a strong start, you could definitely grow that on a, on a decent sized windowsill. It was, it didn't require much more than, I think it, I had it in about a 20 litre and it probably could have even done with a bit less. It was so little. So I think the thing to 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 try and find is the dwarf varieties because those ones have been bred to 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 stay compact even more so than the the kind of um, determinate bush kind. And um and yeah, all the tumbling because they are very happy in in hanging baskets, and that's a really great way to use space as well. So that's what I would say. But yeah, it was a re- on real seeds. That was the... Uh, well, it's it's so funny you should say that because literally uh, about two weeks ago, mm. I actually mentioned that very tomato variety on the show. You did? Some, <laughs> I did. I, funnily enough, I haven't grown it, but somebody was asking a question about tomatoes, yeah. which was to do with them being overwatered while they were away. I mean, I love real seeds. I, you know, I think they are just brilliant and I love buying stuff from them. And I just happened to have seen that house tomato variety on their website and thought oh i'm gonna mention this because this looks really good yeah. and i'm so glad that i've now got your confirmation that it is uh really good as good as it says it i is. loved so that's, it that's cool i just i think i was just so completely captured by how little it stayed it was so yeah. it, it, made, it just means it was so accessible it's just like it's, it's totally brilliant so yeah also what an excellent um company to to support they are really doing yeah, the great they are work of amazing. seed you know seed heritage like retention and they're just really doing that doing that great sea keeping work so i would definitely direct people to them there's some really cool stuff on their website there's amazing things there is some there is some really cool stuff especially if you're growing in containers on a small level Mm. some of their oriental greens are amazing absolutely yeah so much interesting stuff absolutely yeah i'm definitely going to be trying that i mean one of the things about tomatoes is i don't know if you've ever got that um there's a seed saving organization whose name now escapes me but it's based in the u.s and if you subscribe to them you get this massive massive used to be it used to be on paper perhaps it's virtual now this massive list of seeds that can be swapped and the list of tomatoes is i'm not joking thousands (laughs) i'm wondering whether that ties into the idea about tomatoes being this very kind of foundation plant in that it's amazing the amount of work that presumably thousands of people have put into breeding tomatoes over the years Mm. to get such a range of different sizes and growth habits and colors and textures Mm. and that's what I love tapping into with tomatoes is just you know like growing these weird unusual varieties you never heard of because in there there's just a rich history of of people like going well I want a tomato that looks like this Mm. and has this qualities and I love digging into all Absolutely. that stuff. But yeah, as you say, not all of them are good for, for <laughs> No, um, definitely settings. not. I think that's, um, that's the only thing that's a bit of a shame when it comes to kind of container growing is that it does it does somewhat limit sometimes the, the range of, of varieties that you can, you can try. Because, you know, if you are really excited about growing an amazing heirloom, often they're the bigger the bigger varieties and they're the ones that need to be in a graph in the ground you know but there are there are some really wonderful varieties that are, are pretty compact and it's definitely worth a go and i i mean I, I speaking about seed saving i love seed saving and, and tomatoes are a classic because they they don't cross as readily as some other plants and so they're a really good starter plant to, to learn how to seed save and like engage with that process so it, it doesn't surprise me usually that that list is so so long because they're such a I don't know, they, for me, they're such a foundational plant too. And I, I just, I love the flavour and I think they just pretty much go in everything. And growing your own is, I mean, it, it's not a guarantee of amazing flavour. Some of the flavours are a little like that. But um, but there, there is something very satisfying. If you get enough sunshine, you're going to get some, some fantastic flavours. So that's... Well, I'm going to send you, Claire, I'm going to send you some seeds of my favourite heritage tomato, which is called Spike. Yes, and it please. Is a, it's a green and pink striped tomato, <gasps> mid, mid-size. Wow. It's really... I, if I, I, did I put it on my Instagram? I might have put it on my Instagram, but yeah, it's really good. Oh, Jane, that would make um, me I've so happy. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's so good. And it's a really like tasty tomato. And I'm growing it next to a black tomato, mm-hmm. which is one of the, I think it was one of the first black tomatoes, Indigo Rose, mm. which is really tasteless. It looks amazing, but it's really tasteless. But this spike, it's really, it's a really, it's a, uh, so, somebody from a US seed company sent it to me years ago, but it's so good. I'll That's send so you fantastic. Some I would some. love that. Thank you so yeah, much. What a gift. I love, I love that you know well, so I well love... that. That's exactly what would just break my boat. Like, <laughs> somebody knows that if somebody knows me they know that like giving me seed is this is a direct yeah. arrow into my heart so yeah thank you so much <laughs> well and I, spe- I just want more people to grow it because yeah. i just think it's a really good tomato Fantastic. i mean the only, the only thing is if you're you and i'm sure you're this is not you but if you're used to only growing traditional red tomatoes it can be a little bit tricky to know when it's ripe because because it's green semi-green mm. when it's ripe so you really have to like get to, to grips with feeling yeah. it yeah just giving it a good squeeze totally. but yeah it's a really nice tomato and yeah my i just can't get them into the house quick enough because my son just comes and eats them. amazing <laughs> but it's funny you say that about the black tomatoes because that just reminded me I, I i took a picture it must have been a couple of years ago now it's two years ago i can see it here um of um of, of a beautiful like kind of black purple variety called Osso Blue. I did, it was it was a friend of mine who was growing it. And I, I somebody asked me like, um, that this is what I've written. I've written, but alas, I hear they're better looking than they are tasting. <laughs> yeah, That's so I, interesting, isn't it? That we sometimes, you know, yeah. go, go for these things because our eyeballs uh, fancy them. But um, actually in the end, sometimes you just want to go for a classic and you know you're going to get a good taste. True. But I think with with growing in containers, looks are important as well, because I find with houseplants and the same with uh, with plants that I'm growing in containers for food, they they need to please my Mm -hmm. eye because if they don't please my eye, I tend to ignore them and not look after them properly. Interesting. So it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I find that <laughs> I know I'm such a shallow person. <laughs> no. But um like in the book you um you have a lovely picture of I'm not sure which purple uh, mange to this is. I'm just looking now, but you've got a picture of a lovely purple mange to and those are amazing. I mean, practically they're also a lot easier to see on the plant and therefore to pick really? at the right stage, I would also say. Definitely. But they're so beautiful that it really makes me want to grow them. And it's the same with with chili peppers, just a really beautiful chili pepper mm. that's a, that goes through a range of colors again just makes me it gets me excited as opposed to something that's just kind of a little bit boring i mean there's a good chili that i've grown in the past called hungarian hot wax oh, yeah. but it looks so boring it does. it's kind it's of like, it's, it's very really vague, dull. isn't it <laughs> it's like yeah a... it's re- literally almost vague. <laughs> but I, if i get a chili that's not so tasty but looks cool then i yeah. sad. i'm a sad person what how, what and it's not even because I'm putting it on Instagram. It's just it draws my eye, and therefore I think, oh, that needs pinching out or watering or Definitely. whatever. As a result, but that makes sense though. If your space is limited, it has to have more than one purpose, right? You, we want it to be a beautiful space that you, you that you want to spend time in, and that having beautiful plants makes that makes that reality. And then also you want it to be productive. So that, I don't I don't think there's anything shallow in that at all. I think if you want it to oh, be well, beautiful, I think you know there's, there are <laughs> lots of plants that aren't that exciting but are delicious. But, but you know that's it makes sense that you'd rather grow something that you fancy with your eyes and as well as your belly. I, there's a beautiful plant that I grew, a beautiful chili that I grew, which has purple fruit on it, and it was and and in fact the foliage is quite purple. It was a very strange shape. It's in it's on page sixty three. It's called Pretty in Purple, and they were, and um, it just didn't even look real. But I loved it. It sort of grew into this little T shape and had them had fruit mostly purple, but then also little pops of orange and red, and and it was just so so pretty. And it was probably one of the things that most that, that got the most questions asked about it. Everybody wanted to know what variety it was because it was just so handsome. So I'm, I'm yeah, with that's you. Lovely. It's a really really lovely. Plant. It looks like little fairy lights. Yeah, it's gorgeous. that's a really really nice one. <laughs> yeah, and the, yeah, the foliage is such a nice purple as well. I absolutely loved growing that one. So yeah, I'm with you on gorgeous. a pretty plant.
We'll be back with more from Claire shortly, but it's time for Question of the Week, which comes from Heather, who is from Ottawa in Canada, one of my many, many Canadian listeners. Heather's question is an interesting one. She has a Crassular ovata, the jade plant or the money plant, as it's often known. And she bought this plant online and it's been under a grow light and living its best life. But something a little bit odd is happening. The leaves that were on the plant when she got it are regular jade plant sized. I don't know, a a centimetre or a half across by two or three centimetres long. But all the leaves that have grown since she got the plant are about a third to a half of that size. They've gone teeny and she can't figure out why. This struck me as a very interesting question that I wanted to answer. And I did actually put this out for comment from some other succulent experts for their opinion, because I wasn't entirely sure of the cause. But the general consensus seemed to be that it wasn't a lack of light. After all, this plant was under quite a good quality grow light. If it was a light issue, not enough light, we'd be seeing something of the effect of lengthening of the space between the nodes, the bits where the leaves come out. You know, if you listen to the show regularly, etiolation can be a real problem in succulents. But this plant is displaying none of that. I'll put a picture in the show notes to show you the plant. No, it's the the internodal distance is absolutely fine, if not quite small in this plant. The problem is that the leaves are very small. But we reckon that this plant is a cutting from a much bigger jade plant remembering that jade plants can get very large you know they can be trees you often see them in Chinese takeaways and they're absolutely enormous or one taking over somebody's conservatory so I think this is a cutting of a a mature plant that's been cut away from the main plant rooted and potted up and sold which is absolutely fine there's no there's nothing wrong with doing that as a way of making new plants and in fact it is the most common way of propagating crassula ovata So suddenly you've got a plant that's used to being attached to a really big root system that suddenly those leaves are connected to a root system that's obviously way smaller because it's a cutting in a small pot. And the plants responded by putting out those smaller leaves. Now, I think this is a pretty good theory. I am not 100% sure I've completely cracked the answer to this one, but it, it seems like a good theory that the plant, because it's had that shock of being taken as a cutting and then put into a smaller pot and rooted the plants responded by going back to a more juvenile form of foliage if you've got any theories though I'd love to know what you think because maybe this is something that has happened to you I have experienced this with other succulent plants like Hoyas where you've got quite a big leaf and then the first new leaves that come through will stay quite small I guess it's the plant just cutting its cloth to suit its root system if that isn't a mixed metaphor Um, but it's a really interesting phenomenon and uh, thanks very much to Heather for sending it through the plant looks perfectly healthy so I don't think she's got anything to worry about it'll be interesting to see that whether the plant does actually start to grow bigger and increase the size of those leaves as the root ball grows and the plant is able to access more nutrients as it is Heather's got a lovely healthy looking succulent so what What's not to like? I just love the way that plants always have the ability to surprise us. If you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me an email, ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com. I know I keep saying this, but we have got a Q&A special coming up soon. So get your questions in and I will do my best to answer as many as I can. And before we go back to Claire, I've got a few shout outs. Claire in the UK, MJG1992, Houseplants in the Desert, Manders in the Burbs and Jonathan, all in the US, and Elsa in South Africa. Thank you. You've all written beautiful reviews about the show, which gave me a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. And I must just mention Pradagi's review in particular, because (laughs) the summary, their their final line of the review said, in summary, if you don't listen to this podcast, you're a dummy. (laughs) I wouldn't quite go that far, Pradagi, but I, I appreciate your sentiment. So thank you very much for leaving reviews for On The Ledge. And also, big shout out to three people who have decided to pay annually to become a legend on Patreon. That's Kaylee, Joanna and Rebecca. They have all pledged 
their support to On The Ledge via our crowdfunding platform and they've unlocked a whole year of extra episodes of An Extra Leaf. This is my Patreon-only podcast. You can only hear it if you donate $5 a month or more. I do a free podcast that goes out four times a month, so I don't feel too bad about charging an extra five bucks to hear more of my dulcet tones. Do check that out in the show notes if you too are interested in becoming a patron. And if you're an existing patron and you want to swap over to an annual payment, that is totally possible too. Look out for a message coming to your inbox soon, which will explain how to do that. And now back to my chat with Claire and we're moving on to talk about Black Lives Matter and Claire's reaction to it. And there was one particular Instagram post that I knew I had to ask Claire about. Warning, this is where the F words start coming in. It's been a challenging few months and and obviously we're all in lockdown so it was already challenging. And then when this this kind of reignition of the Black Lives Matter movement sort of came about, it seemed like finally these important and necessary conversations were, were suddenly sort of bubbling and, and the possibility of actually having them in this way that was seemingly paradigm shifting was coming up. And I mean, if I go all the way sort of back to the beginning of how I ended up raising my voice in the beginning, I was particularly uh, affected by the, the the video of the woman in Central Park who was threatening to call the police on the murder and in, in using using language that was was very it was really dangerous you know putting his life in danger effectively and and, and show, showing that she knew exactly how to weaponize her her white privilege in order to put him in a position where he was you know he could have lost his life you don't know how these things could turn out and so I was really affected by that because it happened in a a space of nature and and this is something I think about quite a lot about who is seen in nature and who is included in the kind of imagery that we see around kind of nature environmentalism conservationism and you know kind of outdoorsiness and and for the longest time, I've talked about how the the representations, both in kind of gardening media and and environmental conversations, that just don't include include people who look like me. And there's a lot of very complicated feelings that I have about that that didn't necessarily have space to be expressed within both my kind of personal and professional spaces. But also, I just didn't see those conversations happening in any kind of bigger and more profound ways. And, and then so when, when the Black Lives Matter movement sort of get started gaining more visibility and momentum in the, you know, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, um, I felt called to sort of share my perspective on it because what was seemed to be happening then is that we were, we were taking that lens of, of the importance of the visibility of, of black people and people of color more broadly in every domain and so this is my world you know gr- growing food growing plants horticulture agriculture that's my world and so that's the the place where I felt like I wanted to speak it was what I wanted to speak about and my experience of it and in it and so I, I wrote this piece that I shared in my newsletter that was called I don't belong here um just to kind of I don't know, it was a real outpouring. It came from a real gut and a heart place. It wasn't necessarily something that I expected to be shared quite as widely as it was. And it was something that I just felt I needed to say. And and I don't even know necessarily who I was expecting to read it. Maybe nobody. I just felt like I needed to say it. And, and it ended up being a piece that was sort of shared quite widely and um, amongst both kind of my friends and my colleagues and, and in, in some institutions it actually ended up in the new statesman and i know that it kind of did the rounds around q and the rspb because some people had had kind of picked it up and and shared it with their colleagues and and um and it and it sort of ignited a lot of conversations you know a lot of people reaching out to me either to say that they they read my words and it resonated with their experience um as a person of color or other people who said i had no idea that, that you felt this way or that anyone could feel this way i never thought of nature as some somewhere that isn't a place that's safe for everybody and i never thought that it could be exclu- exclusionary in any way and so there was lots and lots of conversations happening and then um uh there was a day i think it was june the second where there was supposed to be a social media blackout and um you know, the, we could have a long conversation as to whether that actually meant anything. But um, there was meant to be a social media blackout followed by a few days where the the social media was was 
intended to amplify black voices that the you know that that those kind of the accounts that were uh, run by white people and dominated by images of white people were just supposed to kind of quieten down for a few days and particularly on that Tuesday to just you know let the stories and the voices of black people rise to the surface and I just looked around and I saw so many like kind of horticultural agricultural grow your own gardening accounts all just carrying on as if nothing was happening and I looked and I just thought wow either you don't realize or you don't care and both of those things are really upsetting for me because if you don't realise that it means that you don't know that, that someone like me and people like me who are in your world exist or you don't care that we exist. And I was really upset by that. I just thought, what's the harm in piping down for a couple of days and showing that you actually give a damn about the lived experience and the, the words and the, the sharing of, of black people? for a few days like you didn't have to post that picture of a flower and you didn't have to post that picture of your beans you could have just stopped for a few days and, and paid attention and take it taken it as an opportunity to listen and learn and then and so then I wrote a series of stories <laughs> where I I said this and I said you know I found, I found it really hurtful to see that there's so many people who think it's just fine to carry on as normal as though this wasn't an important and impactful week for a lot, a lot of people. And uh, I ended it with, uh, I, I'm saying this because you've given me permission to swear, right? It, it sticks in my throat a little. I hope that's okay. <laughs> but I just said... <laughs> And there's an awkwardness here, isn't there? Which is, of course, uh, which is kind of part of the part of the intrinsic nature of what you're trying to say. Yeah. Is well, I just basically said, "Fuck your fucking French beans," because it doesn't matter. Not right now. I'm not saying fuck your beans forever, and I'm not saying fuck you either. I'm just saying you didn't have to post that at this time when the black community is actually really hurting in so many ways, and and this is a time of reflection and learning and listening. And instead, what you chose to do is carry on like it doesn't matter. And that's because you have the privilege of carrying on because it doesn't affect you. And that was what I was trying to say, at which point I got quite the epic unfollowing, which I, I, I expected. In fact, I think I wrote something like cue the unfollows, which did happen. And it did happen along with a number of people telling me exactly why they were unfollowing me and why I was in the wrong. And it was a lot of, there was a lot of tone policing and a lot of telling me how I should express my frustration and hurt and and I found that even more frustrating but I expected it let me guess were a lot of those people white people they were all white people <laughs> <laughs> oh what a surprise <laughs> yes funnily enough it was people who really didn't want to hear it and it was interesting the ways in which they framed their resistance to what I was saying. Like, how dare I tell people what to do? And I was like, I didn't tell anyone what to do. I actually just expressed my hurt at choices that people made at this time. And, you know, and a lot of people were like, this is why I post. I do it for my mental health. How dare you tell me to stop? And I said, I didn't tell you to delete your account. I didn't tell you to, you know, to to jump in the sea I said that this was a couple of days where you could have chosen just to be quiet and that choice and your choice not to really communicate something powerful to me and so it was an interesting an interesting very very stressful very painful few days of having to kind of feel these people telling me I was wrong and my my lovely partner Sam Air, um as a way of cheering me up because a couple of people well not a couple of people a lot of people were really supportive and they were like yeah I agree with you because I saw it too and I thought it was really tone deaf and really inappropriate and then at least four people said you should make that into a t-shirt I'd buy that and I thought it was really funny and I was like haha that would be really really rude to wear down the supermarket but then my partner thought it would be cheer me up to to paint it <laughs> and so he made a painting created a painting for me that said Black Lives Matter fuck your fucking French beans. And then I shared it with a few friends and they said, you should share it on Instagram. And then maybe if there's a few people who might want to, to buy one, then, you know, maybe you could raise a little bit of money. And uh, I thought, yeah, you know what? Those people have unfollowed me. What's the, what, what could I possibly lose with, for, for saying this again? I meant what I said and I'll, I'd say it again. And, and so I posted it and it 
we it did the rounds it, it went pretty far and wide and more unfollows but then also lots and lots and lots of support and and so we ended up going from Sam having painted 10 paintings to him painting over 50 and raising in the end I think it was it was two, about two thousand two hundred pounds for Black Minds Matter and the Black Curriculum and Land in Our Names. And so, despite how uh, trying a a few weeks, a few days that was, some good stuff came out of it, and I made my point. My pro- probably wrong feeling is always to try to sort of educate with love, but sometimes there has to be a voice like yours, which just told it like it isn't I don't but you 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 are going to get lots of, of kickback from that and you did get kickback but you know more power to you for doing it because it's a message that horticulture needs to hear because there's a lot of very comfortable lovely flowers kind of approach to life that that possibly well that they're not possibly that is excluding lots of people from horticulture just because they feel like they wouldn't fit in absolutely and and I'm, no, I'm with you I, I I do really think that the best way for somebody to to see where you're coming from is to come from a human place and uh, uh, and a place of love and and I suppose the way that I chose to express myself in that moment was a uh, an expression of love for myself, an expression of defense yes. of my heart. Like you know, that was something that was really wounding to watch people who I would hope would see me as part of their community completely ignore my either ignore my existence or or ignore the fact that this this thing that was unfolding would affect me and I'm part of that community too, you know? And so, so I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I do. I just think that it was an expression of like, of, of, of love from, for, for those around me and for myself as well to say, that's not okay. And I need to, to say that out loud and you don't have to agree with me, but I know I need to say it. And, and yeah, I think, I think horticulture is, is, um it is a very, it's a very white, industry it's a very white space both in the kind of in collective imagination and 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 in reality as well you know but black growers and gardeners exist we're out there it's not just a handful of us there's plenty of us and I, I just think we all deserve to have an industry that has space for us for our or multitudes of stories and that reflects us and supports us and encourages us to all be part of a community that is vibrant and full of difference in the best possible way and you know I think horticulture just really suffers from like this weirdly homogenous image of one kind of person gardening only and I think it was Sue the temperate gardener who wrote to um a gardening magazine and off the top of my head I think it's the RHS gardening magazine but I could be wrong and so apologies if I am but I did see you know a letter to the editor that went in that talked about kind of what what representation looks like within their pages and and the pushback was you know are black people gardening though you know it was it wasn't literally that glib but it was something similar to that and it was just the erasure was bizarre frankly because it's just like not even real or true but it was also deeply painful because if people don't even think that you exist then they're not going to try and speak to you in any way shape or form in the kind of ways that garden media or gardening organizations communicate and and so of course we get left out and I just think of how much working with plants has has changed transformed enriched and like created the deepest of meaning for my life I think of all the people who might also experience it the same way who don't see it as something that's for them I mean I ch- I was so lucky it was pure chance that I found my way to plants I was completely indifferent to them before this encounter in New York that completely changed the trajectory of my life but not everybody can bank on having a, a moment of serendipity like that right I think we should be able to see ourselves in this world all all of us so that we know that this is for us yeah i think that for me is the most painful part of it to think that there's a whole segment of society that has missed out on this experience because of racism and and, and other kinds of um, prejudice also but oh yeah classism is strong in horse culture for sure and you think oh, gosh there must be some amazing growers some amazing designers some amazing horticulturists who don't exist because mm. of this and that's that really is is painful to think about and i guess the only way to, to deal with that and to tackle that is just moving forward to try to change Absolutely. the structures as as the wider black lives matter movement is trying to do
Totally. I completely agree. It's been really encouraging on On the Ledge to have a overwhelmingly positive reaction to stuff that I've said about Black Lives Matters. I think I had I had one, I'm just trying to think, I had uh, one review and I think one message from somebody who wasn't, uh, who, who basically, whose argument was basically, I just want to talk about plants. And mm. I mean, I, again, I'm trying to address the fact that you can't really talk about plants without talking about where they come from and, totally. and slavery and all kind of different kinds of, of, of fascinating topics, which I'm hoping to get into in, in future episodes, looking at actually, you know, you, you can't you can't separate plants off from any of this stuff. It's part of the rich tapestry of plants. Some of it's painful, but we need to look at it to understand them fully. So and, and also just it's that's that's just the, the uh, typifies the erasure of those stories, which is completely it, it's it's part of colon, colonialism's um, you know kind of reason reason to exist is is that's what domination looks like. It's it's erasing that which came before it, and, and that you know it's, it's erasing the stories. It's erasing those those narratives. It's erasing histories, and and that happened to people. That happened to to the you know my ancestors. Absolutely. But it ha- it's happened to plants too. We look in our gardens and, you know, most of the beautiful things that are growing there came because I- I arrived here as a result of the same pillage that was taking place throughout the world, throughout different colonial enterprises it you know that's that's how those those got those plants came to these shores and so to say you just want to talk about plants is well it's privilege in action isn't it it's just choosing to talk about one aspect of them that pleases you without acknowledging all the journeys that they took in order to to get here and who was responsible for that and what that symbolized and then what that also all the consequences that 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 had you know those these wonderful botanical gardens may be beautiful but they were also colonial tools that upheld the institution of slavery and made it possible for so many people to have been you know sacrificed and died and murdered and exploited and yes it's ugly but the I can tell you as somebody who has had to claw back this knowing this knowledge these stories as an adult it's so painful to realize that you you live in a country that refuses to acknowledge that as though it wasn't important and it doesn't matter and and so for me, it has, it has, it still is a very live space that I'm trying to, to figure out for myself and reconcile that, you know, I work with plants and in, and that is not a space that is a benign space. It's a radical space. And to, to do this work for me is an act of reclamation of, of that, that which was erased. But, but, in, but I do think, yeah, there are bigger, wider conversations to be had because these institutions well, quite literally all of them, all of horticulture was, is, was built on colonialism. And it's only when we look those things in the eye that we can be, be honest about them, that someone like me can go through a process of healing that makes it possible for me to access those things. And then, you know, then we, we can even consider moving forward in, in unity, right? It's like, as long as we're in denial, then we're always going to be pushing someone's story somewhere to the side. That's just, Well, for me, that's just not good enough. Uh, we've gone a long way away from your book, but in a way we haven't, <laughs> <That's okay>. actually. <laughs> in a way we haven't, because actually we should be thinking about all these issues with that in our background. And I think the the other message that's coming out of this is anybody can do this. Armed with a, a bit of information, this is accessible to everybody, whatever. Yeah. Whether You don't have to own a massive, huge two-acre garden to grow food. You can acquire knowledge and get these skills with a few pots on the patio mm-hmm. and that's a powerful message too yeah that thank you so much for saying that because that's my my greatest hope is um is that this book is useful it's useful to people who want to get started because it is very much a beginner's guide you know it's a real from scratch guide to how to how to grow in whatever space you have available to you my hope is that it's accessible you know uh, especially, I mean, I, one of the things I think is is really amazing about growing in in pots and containers is is that you can put them at a level that you can actually access them. So you don't have to be somebody who can who can kneel down and put their hands in the ground. As as wonderful as that process is, if that's not accessible for you, then growing in containers is is an alternative. It's an answer to that. So my hope is that it's yeah, it's accessible in various ways, and that. It will encourage people who thought that maybe they couldn't do it to to give it a try because it also doesn't require you to 
seek out a piece of land that you can you can then cultivate you really can start right the second you know it's it's a it's hopefully it's an accessible enough introduction into to getting started so yeah we could we could go into ableism but we won't do that but my hope (laughs) is my hope is that it shows that it's possible to do this even if you're you know have access needs that or access support needs that uh that prevent you from from being able to kind of garden in in the ways that we see on the magazines and on the telly and in the collective imagination you know there's going to be gardeners with different needs and they should be gardening too my hope is that my book will maybe help that happen what a great message to finish on claire thank you very much for joining me today it's been delightful i'm, oh, I'm thank gonna you for be, having me. i need you to email me your address for those seeds oh, sure. i should also <laughs> say that I'll, I'll include in the show notes um details of the book and uh all of that jazz and i'll also include um links to your instagram and thank also you. to to sue's instagram as well because i think she uh, yes. I think she's a temperate gardener, isn't she? She is, is right? and she's been um, amazing. She has her been amazing. resources are remarkable, and she has been, yes. yeah, speaking she's truth to re- power in a in a way that I have, I'm deeply grateful for because for you know for me it's so exhausting. Yeah, any, anyone who wants to educate themselves on this stuff, you and 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 her have been doing amazing work. So it's definitely worth following you guys. Um, Thank and we'll put all much. that in the in the show notes for everyone to take a look at but um yeah best of luck with the book and i hope it sells really well thank you uh, i'll get those seeds off in the post you once they've gone through their process of of, of being stuck in a jar and rotten uh, stinky rotten, rotten dried. And, uh, i have to i have to put a sign on it because everyone thinks i'm like you know what, what this needs chucking away so yeah. I'm just like do not well, don't open this. this either don't <laughs> no. open this and check you won't be happy with the results yeah, exactly <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been lovely. Claire's book, How to Grow Your Dinner Without Leaving the House, is published by Lawrence King and is available in all good bookshops, as they say. If you've never tried saving tomato seed, don't be put off by the fact it's a bit stinky. It's also very fun. If you're a Patreon subscriber, you can go and listen to an episode of An Extra Leaf where I talk about how it's done. And if you're not a Patreon subscriber, just trust me. Uh, If you're not a subscriber, I'll put a link in the show notes to some instructions on how to do it. That's all for this week's show. I'll be back next Friday to talk about rare plants. In the meantime, I'm off to lust after Sansevieria Bantel sensation. Bye. The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, Friends by Jazar, and Whistle by Benjamin Banger. The ad music is Whistling Rufus by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit janeperone.com for details. 